And, um, and the song that we're going to sing is uh, Bring Them In. Bring Them In. Anybody knows that song here? Amen. Bring Them In. Okay, we're going to sing just one stanza in English and in German. Bring Them In. And uh, I'd like to quote a verse of the Bible in German for you. That's John 3.16. John 3.16. So sehr hat Gott die Welt geliebt, dass er sei ein geborenen Sohn gab, damit jeder, der an ihn glaubt, nicht verloren geht sondern das ewige Leben hat. Hört hier des Hitten Stimm so bang, wie sich du Speck und Wüsten drang. Schafe sie vom Bär verirrt, so immer noch Betreue hier. Bring sie heim, bring sie heim, bring sie heim aus der Sünde und Pein. Bring the heim, bring the heim, bring the world and then to Jesus. Out in the desert hear the cry, out on the mountains wild and high. How is the master speaks to thee, go find my sheep where we be. Bring them in, bring them in, bring them in from the face of sin. Bring them in, bring them in, bring the wandering ones to Jesus. Bring them in, bring them in, bring them in from the face of sin. Bring them in, bring them in, bring the wandering ones to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, before, before I start, we get, get into the message tonight, I'd like to take a few moments and uh, give a short, a short word of testimony. And uh, I apologize that the video didn't work, and certainly I was excited for you to see uh, a little bit about our work in Germany. But we are planning to leave by March, uh, March next year, we're planning to leave and, and go back to Germany uh, to, to start the, the church in Frankfurt. We're going to work with a pastor named uh, Pastor Falkenberg. Now, Pastor Falkenberg is a German pastor, and he was reached uh, by American Baptist missionaries. And uh, he's been a pastor for over 15 years, and so we're going to work with him for, for about a year. And then we'll, go, we'll move from that area to start a church uh, in the city of Frankfurt. Now, the best thing that ever happened to me, the greatest thing that ever happened to me, uh, besides my wife, <laughs> besides getting to know my wife, is that I got saved. Amen. And I got saved when I was a teenager in Cameroon, Africa. I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And then uh, right after high school, I moved to Germany uh, to go to college like my friends here uh, tonight. So uh, I went to Germany to go to college. I went to the city of Berlin, Germany. And uh, while I was in Berlin, Germany, God began to work in my heart about, about being a preacher, about being a preacher of the gospel. Now, at the college I went to was an electrical engineering college. So I did not go there to become a preacher. But uh, God began to work in my heart. And so while I was in college, I surrendered to the Lord to be a preacher of the gospel. And uh, by the time I graduated from college, I already knew God was calling me to missions. But I did not know what he wanted me to do. I did not know where he wanted me to go. And so uh, it was around that time when I finished that I met my wife in Germany. And uh, we got married. We moved to a city called Nuremberg, Germany, in the southern part of Germany. And while I was in Nuremberg, we got involved with the church. And uh, through the church, God allowed us to know a ministry in, in uh, Beaufort in Georgia, on the west side of Atlanta, and uh, to know a ministry that had a Bible college, a Bible institute. And so uh, many years ago, we moved to the United States, and my, my, my desire was to go to Bible college because I knew God has called me to ministry. And so I went to Bible college there. And while I was in Bible college, it was, uh, you know, the church had a Bible institute three times a week on the evening. And so I had a full-time job uh, in, in Georgia. 
And so I went to work. I got hired by a German company. Now, I was not looking for a German company, but, but I got hired by a German company. And, uh, you know, every year, I worked for eight years, and every year uh, I went to Germany at least twice, you know, sometimes three times a year. And I would go to Germany for extended trips. And so one of those times I went to Stuttgart, where the headquarter of my company was, and uh, I went to a church like this, uh, you know, a good church. I heard about a church. I just went into the church, and they had a service. I came back on Sunday night, and on Sunday night, the pastor, he called me on the side. He said, hey, Brother Patrick, uh, do you preach sometimes? <laughs> and uh, it surprised me because I did not tell him I was called to preach. I did not tell him, you know, I was in Bible college. I did not tell him I wanted to be a missionary. I just told him I was an engineer on a business trip in Germany. Uh, but, but obviously the Holy Spirit spoke to him. And so, and I said, yes, you know, I, and I told him the story that, you know, I feel like God has called me to ministry and I'm preparing to be a pastor. And so uh, he asked me if I could preach the next Sunday night, that, uh, the, the next Sunday night. And so I did that. And then God began to open doors. Every time I go to Germany, uh, it would be, you know, different churches calling me. Uh, Brother Moser in Stuttgart, Brother Falkenberg uh, in Frankfurt, and then Brother Byers in Nuremberg, Germany. That's our former church. And so God began to open doors for me to minister in Germany. And so I realized God was turning my business trips into mission trips. And uh, he was using my company to finance the mission trips. And, uh, and so one, one night, I preached for Brother Falkenberg. He's in the video. I wish you could have heard of him. But I preached for him in, in the, in just outside of Frankfurt. And so he asked me that night, he said, Brother Patrick, when you graduate from Bible college, what are you going to do? I said, well, I don't know. I'm praying. You know, whatever God wants, that's what I will do. And uh, he said, will you consider coming, to, coming back to Germany and help us start churches in Germany? And I said, yes, I would. And, uh, and then later, uh, Brother, Brother Moser in Stuttgart, he asked me one day, he said, Brother Patrick, when you graduate from Bible college, what are you going to do? <laughs> I said, I don't know. You know, I'm just praying, and, and we just open. He said, when you graduate from Bible college, will you consider coming back to Germany and help us reach the people of Germany? And so I began to realize that God had other plans, you know. And uh, when we left Germany, I thought we were leaving Germany for good. We had no plans to go back, but God had a plan. And... Uh, and so he called us back in Germany. So in 2017, in 2017, I surrendered to the Lord. And I, and I, was, I knew for sure God was calling us back to reach the people of Germany. And uh, our burden is the burden you have here tonight. I, I noticed even through, through during the prayer that this church has a burden for lost souls, you know, for people who are lost. And this is a burden we have for the German people. You know, I, spent, I went to college in Germany. I worked there. And, and I just saw the need. I did not know that God would bring me back. But God has just placed the German people in my heart, and we want to work and, and labor in the Lord uh, to see them come to Christ. And so that's our prayer, and I pray that you pray for us, that God will help us in this work, that he will open the hearts of the people of Germany. And, uh, but also that he will send more laborers to Germany. And maybe there's somebody here tonight, maybe the Lord is calling you uh, to reach the people of Germany. And uh, so there's a great need there, so we want you to pray for us. Now, if you have your Bible, turn, if you would, in a book of Jonah, book of Jonah tonight, and uh, it will be a short message, um, because I don't like to be stoned, so I'll be short. <laughs> no. Uh, the book of Jonah, this is the Old Testament, the Old Testament, the book of Jonah, the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 3, Jonah chapter 3, and uh, we're going to start in verse number 1, the book of Jonah Chapter number 3, verse number 1. Well, Jonah chapter 3, verse number 1, and here's what the Bible says. The Bible says in the word, now, if you haven't found your place yet, just pull any place and just look intelligently, you know, and you're, nobody will find out anyway. So, uh, Jonah chapter 3. Verse number one, Jonah chapter three, verse number one, and I'm going to start to read, uh, starting with verse number one, Jonah chapter three. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. And the Bible says in verse number three that Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. 
Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey, and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed the fast, and uh, put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even uh, to the least of them. And God saw, verse number 10, uh, jump if you will to verse number 10, and God saw their works, that they turned from the evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he will do unto them, and he did it not. This is one of, the, this is one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament, and the, 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 the story of Jonah. And um, tonight, I'd like to bring a simple message that I've entitled, uh, The God of Jonah. The God of Jonah. You know, when you read the Bible... Uh, you know, any kind of book, the story of Esther, creation, uh, you can learn about the things that God created when you read Genesis, or you can learn about the God who created the world. You know, when you read the story of Esther, you can learn about, you know, a, a, poor, a poor young girl who became the queen of the Persian Empire, or you can learn about the God who made her queen. And so what I want to do tonight is just look at this story of Jonah, but look, looking from God's perspective. What do we learn about our God from the book of Jonah? And uh, this, is, this is our God. This is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So it doesn't change. It does not change. And so I want to look at lessons, things that we can learn about God from the book of Jonah. Uh, let's pray and then we'll get started. Father, thank you for the message tonight. And I thank you for, I thank you for salvation. I thank you uh, that you saved me. As a young man, and uh, what a wonderful life to know Jesus Christ. And I pray that tonight, if someone is not saved, that that person will come uh, to know Christ as, as his or her Savior. And I pray, Father, that you would uh, help me with your spirit. I pray, Holy Spirit, Father, that your spirit will strengthen me and uh, that you will give me a clarity of thoughts, uh, that you will fill me and that you will use me tonight. I pray that we all hear from heaven. In the name of Jesus, I pray it. Amen. Well, if you've been saved, uh, if you've been Christian any length of time, you know the story of Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. Now, he was a prophet in Israel. And uh, the Bible tells us that, you know, Jonah was a prophet. He had no plans to go out of Israel. But one day, God showed up at his door, and God gave him a command. And God told him, uh, arise, go to Nineveh, which is the capital of the, Persian, the, the Assyrian Empire, and God said, that great city says, preach unto it the preaching that I be thee. Now, in Jonah chapter 1, we see Jonah rise like God told, as God told him to. And Jonah did arose, and Jonah did go, but he did not go where God sent him. He decided to go another way. God sent him to, uh, to, to Nineveh here, but he decided to go to Tarshish. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. In fact, the Ninevites were very wicked people. And so Jonah had no desire for them to be saved. He didn't want them to be saved. And so he's running away uh, from the will of God. And so he finds a sheep, and he boards a sheep. And the Bible tells us that, you know, he boards that sheep, and then uh, God sends a great storm, a great storm. And he's running from God. And uh, it's, it's, it's similar to our lives. You know, often when we depart from the ways of God, the Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. You see, when, when you and I as Christians, we depart from the way of God, sometimes God sends a great wind, a great storm. And so the wind comes, and uh, those sailors, they are experienced sailors, but they try to control the boat. But soon they find out that there's something unusual about this storm. <laughs> they just cannot control it. And so, and so they speak with Jonah, make a long story short. Jonah tells them that he's a prophet and that God has sent him to Nineveh to preach the gospel, and that he's running away from God. And so Jonah says, so cast me overboard, and, 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 and that will be it. You know, God will calm the storm, and everything will be quiet. And so they do that reluctantly. They cast Jonah overboard, and lo and behold, the same thing that happened when Jesus spoke to the wind and the waves happens. Everything becomes calm, and God calms the storm. But now Jonah is in the waters, and the Bible says that God sends a great fish. Uh, a whale, Jesus tells us, and the whale swallows Jonah. And Jonah spends three days and three nights in the whale's belly. The Bible tells us it was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, who spent three days and three nights in the bottom of the earth, not because of his own sins, but because of our sins. 
And so it was a picture of Christ dying for us. And he spends three days and three nights. And after three days and three nights, the, the fish throws Jonah overboard on the shores of Nineveh. Back to the place where God has sent him. And now the word of the Lord come back to, comes back to him in chapter number 3. And uh, God says the same thing that he told him before, verse 2. He says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it, the preaching that I bid thee. I want to observe a couple of things tonight. First of all, uh, we see that there was a great city. There was a great city. Jonah 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry unto it. For the wickedness is come up before me. In Jonah chapter uh, 3 verse 2, God calls Nineveh again a great city. In Jonah chapter 3 verse 3, he calls Nineveh again a great city. And in Jonah chapter 4 verse 11, he calls Nineveh again a great city. Now, if I, if I call a city great, or you call a city great, well, it depends what is the biggest city you've ever seen, right? It's relatives. You know, if you bring a little child uh, in Staten Island, he will think, man, this is, this is humongous, you know. For a child, you know, five years old, this is a great city. But, you know, if you've been in New York or you've been in Atlanta, then Staten Island doesn't look that great at all, you know, as far as the size is concerned. Now, what, what struck me here is that it's not Jonah that calls Nineveh a great city. It's God. It's God that made the universe that calls a city on this earth great. Now, why does God, how come God calls Nineveh great? Well, because of the people. In Jonah chapter 4, verse 11, the Bible says there were 120,000 children in that city. Now, it's estimated that if you have 120,000 children, you have at least 600,000 people. It was great by the value of its people. Jesus said, what does a man profit if he shall gain the whole world? And lose his own soul. In fact, he says, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What Jesus was saying is that the soul of a man has more value than all the wealth of this world put together. You know, even the soul of a little child <laughs> has more value in the, in the eyes of God than the job that I have, than the money that I possess, the houses. And, uh, and so if, if the soul of a little child has so much value in the eyes of God, how much more the soul of more than 600,000 people. Now, no wonder God calls it. Four times, he says, it's a great city. Now, I thought about the city of Frankfurt. You know, Frankfurt has 5.5 million people, million souls living in it, people that go up and down. Most of them are lost without Christ. I wonder, is it a great city in the eyes of God? I'm sure it is. It's a great city. Now, not only, first of all, there was a great city, but secondly, I want you to observe that the people of Nineveh were in a great danger. A great danger. When Jonah comes into the city, Jonah chapter 3, verse 4, he says, Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. You see, if you had gone into Nineveh before Jonah showed up, you would have found people getting the children ready for school. You know, you would have found people uh, re remodeling their homes. Uh, you would have found people planning vacations. Some others were maybe taking vacations in Nineveh. You would have found people trying hard to make money, you know, eating outside, strolling along the beach. Now, you would have found people busy as, as we are busy today, but they did not realize the people of Nineveh, they did not realize that they were like criminals on the death row. It was just a matter of time. Every child, every adult, every woman, every man, every elder, every retired person, every one of them will die in 40 days. Everyone. But they had no idea. You see, they were just going about their life's business. Like if you go out in Staten Island today and you've been, you know, outside, maybe going to work today, you saw a lot of people. You know, they live as if the world will last forever. Nothing will happen. But the Bible says it is a point unto men once to die. And after this, the judgment. And so the people of Nineveh were in a great danger 
but they did not realize it. They were on the death roll. Forty days, every one of them will perish because of their sins. So not only we see that there was a great city and the people were in a great danger, but we see also the great love of God. If you look with me in Jonah chapter 1, Jonah chapter 1, verse number 1, Jonah chapter 1, verse number 1. Jonah chapter 1, verse number 1. Uh, God says, verse number 2, excuse me, uh, God, uh, verse number 2. He says to, to Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. against it. Why? Why? For, that means because, the wickedness has come up before me. God says the people of Nineveh were so wicked that their wickedness came up before him. Now, there's another city that God destroyed in the Old Testament, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. But when God came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, I'm come down to see, to see if what I've heard is true. And so he sent two angels in the city of Gomorrah. But when he spoke about, about Nineveh, he said they had so much wickedness that their wickedness came up before him. They were wicked people. Now we're all wicked. The Bible says all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. But yet, it was not Jonah's idea to go to Nineveh. Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. <laughs> In fact, when God commanded Jonah to go to Nineveh, God, Jonah decided he would go to Tarshish. He ran from the presence of God. Whose idea was it to go to Nineveh? He was the same God. <laughs> they offended. And so we see here the great love of God. The Bible says, God says in the scriptures, that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. He loved sinners. You know, the Bible teaches that God hates sin. You know, he hates drunkenness, but he loves the drunkard. He hates immorality, but he loves the immoral one. He hates unbelief, but he loves the unbeliever. He hates abortion, which is murder. He loves the murderer. He hates lies, but he loves the lies. He is not willing that any should perish. And so we see God's great love. We see the great city. We see the great danger. But we see also that there was a great message. There was a great message. Here was a message. Jonah chapter 3 verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city. A day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days Nineveh shall be overthrown. It was an eight words message that brought a revival in Nineveh. Eight words. And the king repented, the people repented. The Bible says they fasted and prayed, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil ways, and he had compassion upon them. Now, the message was a supernatural message because it's God that gave the message to Jonah. Jonah did not choose what to preach, he did not choose what to tell the people. God told him told him what to preach. And God has not changed. He has told us what to preach. Amen. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you don't have to turn there, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 3, the Apostle Paul says these words here. He says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture, and that he was seen of Cephas. And of the twelve, the apostle Paul says, the gospel that I preach unto you is not my gospel. It's the gospel that I received. That I received. In the book of Galatians, In the book of Galatians chapter 1, the apostle Paul writes these words. He says, Galatians chapter 1, verse number 11, he says, But I certify unto you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after men, for I neither received it of men, neither was I taught it, 
but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, we have no right to preach our own gospel. We have no right to preach our own way to heaven. We have no right to choose how a man goes to heaven. God has set it up for us in the scriptures that we are saved by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the only way to be saved. And so as we go to Germany, maybe somebody asks, what are you going to preach, Brother Patrick? Well, we're going to preach the same gospel that Paul preached. <laughs> we're going to preach the same gospel uh, that the apostle preached, that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. He was buried, and that he rose again, and that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It was a supernatural message. It came from heaven. But all it was is a supernatural message. It was also a simple message. Eight words, yet 40 days. Nineveh shall be over. You know, the gospel is not hard. The gospel is simple. I, I, I remember a story I heard of a preacher. He was at the airport, and he met a priest. And so he asked the priest, what, what should I do to go to heaven? The priest said, well, you got first to make sure you're baptized. You know? And, uh, and, and, and he said, hold on a minute. And he pulled, uh, he pulled his, um, his booklet, and he said, I want, I want to write down what I need to do to, in order to go to heaven. And so he said, okay, you got to be baptized. He said, is that all? If I get baptized, that's it. He said, oh, no, you got to go to church. <laughs> he said, how often? He said, well, you got to go. You try to go one, at least once every week. And so he wrote down once every week. And he said, is that everything I need to do to go to heaven? He said, no, hold on a minute. you got to take the sacraments. He said, oh, let me write that down because I want to make sure I know for sure how to go to heaven. And so he wrote down sacrament. He said, okay, if I do these three, do I go to heaven? He said, oh, no, no, no. you got to behave. you got to try to keep the commandments. He said, okay, which commandments? He said, okay, you, you shouldn't kill. Okay, I shouldn't kill. So he wrote that down. And so it just kept going like that for about an hour. And the list just got longer and longer and longer and longer. And finally, the priest had to, has to, had to agree. I, I don't know. The truth is, I don't know. I don't know. He said, well... If you, if you were reading the Bible <laughs> that you're holding your hands, you will know. Amen. Because the Bible says, the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? Yeah. He said, believe. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and I shall be saved. It's simple. It's simple. It's the pride of man that makes it hard. <laughs> the gospel is simple. So it was a simple message. It was a supernatural message. But also, it was a saving message that had the power to save. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the apostle Paul writes, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel has power. I just, we just heard earlier today about this brother who got saved last Sunday. Now what saved him? The gospel. The gospel. It makes a difference between heaven and hell. The gospel. The power to save. I like to close tonight, and this is actually my sermon here, the God of Jonah. So what do we learn about the God of Jonah? This is our God, the same God that we serve, the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, we, we, see, that, we see God's desire, that his desire is to save the lost. God's desire is to save the lost. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure, no pleasure. He says, no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And what did he say about Nineveh? It was an exceeding wicked city. But he says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. If you're lost tonight, God has no pleasure that you would die. Now, you deserve to die. But he has no pleasure that the sinner will die. Jesus said, I came to save. To seek and to save that which is lost. He has a desire to save those that are lost. You know, God is the one who primarily wants us to go to Germany. You know, sometimes I get opportunity and, and I share with people our, our burden. They say, well, you know, how, how did you get a burden for Germany? And as much as I have a burden for Germany, God has a greater burden for Germany than I do. You see, because why, why we live here, and many of you have never put foot on Germany. God sees them every day. He sees the little children that grow being thought that there is no God. He sees the people that are, you know, drug alcoholic, alcoholics that um, are just sick and tired. They're hungry, and they try everything in the world 
they have no fulfillment because they have not Christ. And God sees them. You know, I may sometimes forget them. Maybe a day I forget about Germany. But he never forgets them because they're always before him. He has a desire to save the lost. Secondly, we see about God not only that he has a desire to save the lost, we see his deadline, that there is a deadline. God, we see God's deadline. None of us knows when he will meet God. You see, the people of Nineveh, if you had gone to Nineveh and you've met a little boy, you know, maybe a young man, like, how, what was your name again? Jonathan? Yes. If, you, if you've gone to Nineveh and met a young man like Jonathan and, and asked, hey, Jonathan, how long do you think you'll live? He would have said, well, maybe 70 years, 70 years old, right? Maybe 60. If you had gone to Nineveh and found maybe a middle-aged young person, 30 years old, and say, hey, how long do you think you're going to live? <laughs> he would have said, well, I think maybe I have 20 more years to go. How many did they have? 40 days. B less than two months. Every one of them will perish. I just read, uh, the other day I read about a crane. A lady was parked in the middle of downtown, and the, the base of the crane broke from, the, from, from, from a, from a high-rise high building, fell down, and killed her in the car. What are the chances that you get killed by a crane that breaks up? There's more chance to be struck by a lightning than hit by a crane. So you don't know how much time you have. Whatever you think, you don't know. And so that's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Right. You know, don't push it to tomorrow. You know, trust Christ today. Get saved today. But also for us who are saved, we only have today to serve Christ. We don't have tomorrow. Maybe you say, well, maybe in 10 years, I serve Jesus, you know. Well, I'm busy right now. Well, how do you know you have 10 years? We had a man in Germany. We had a Bible study in Nuremberg. His name, uh, his name was um, Emmanuel. And Emmanuel came to the Bible study. We just held the Bible study. And at the end of the Bible study, preacher, we were having, uh, you know, we were just eating together, some fellowship. And he just stood up. He said, I'm hot, I'm hot, I'm hot. And so he was walking toward the window. And so I stood up to kind of help him. And as I was passing by him, he just collapsed. And I just caught him, you know. And then I sat down on the chair with him. Four days later, Emmanuel was in heaven. He never woke up again, never. He went to the hospital, you know, the ER came, they, buried, they carried him. He never came back. But I don't know, you know, I don't know if he had plans. You know, he was, as far as I know, he was serving God. But I don't know if maybe in his heart, God has spoken to him about some matters. And he said, well, maybe next year I'll do it. He didn't have next year. And so today is the day to serve God. And so we see here God's deadline that none of us knows when he will meet God. But lastly, we also see God's patience. We also see God's patience. You know, I've wondered about this story when God sent Jonah to Nineveh. I say, why is God chasing Jonah? <laughs> I mean, there are plenty of people in Israel who could preach. I mean, this is a simple message. Egg words. Even a 16 years old boy could go there and preach it. You didn't need a theologian to tell people yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Why is he chasing Jonah? I mean, Jonah doesn't want to go. Jonah says, I'm going somewhere else. I'm taking my boat. I don't want to do it. But God is after him. God is after him. Why? Could he not use somebody else? Sure he could. <laughs> You think he was the only one qualified? I don't think so. It was a very simple message. Forty days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. Well, it's because the Bible says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. You say, why did he not send somebody else? Well, because somebody else has another calling, <laughs> you see. The Bible says the harvest is plenty, the laborers are few. So he doesn't even have enough people to do the job that he wants to get done. And so maybe sometimes you think in your heart, well, somebody, you know, God, God is calling you. And you say, well, somebody else can do it. No, no, that's not true. The harvest is plenteous, the laborers are few. If God is calling you, it's because he needs you. It's because he needs you. And so God needed Jonah. God needed Jonah. But I, but I see that he's the God of a second chance. <laughs> because even though Jonah ran away from God, God did not give up on Jonah. 
And he will not give up on you. He will not. He just won't. And you know, it's Satan comes sometimes to him and say, well, you made too many mistakes. I mean, God is done with you. Well, if God was done with you, he would have killed you in your sleep. <laughs> That's not hard for him to do. You know, if he lets you breathe, it's because he has a plan for you. Amen. And so, and so I'm, I'm glad that God is the God of the second chance. So we see that God's desire is to save the lost. We see that he has a deadline for every man. But we see also that he's the God of the second chance. I don't know, uh, is God calling you? You know, has the Holy Spirit told you to do something? Maybe the work of God in the house of God. Maybe nobody else knows. But God has been speaking to you. Surrender to him. Just surrender to him. Just surrender to him. Uh, he's big enough to take care of you, and he's big enough to use you. Just surrender to him. Whatever he needs done. The God of Jonah, the God of Jonah. Uh, let's serve him tonight. Preacher, if you would.